So I'm Kate McAfoos. I'm president at Chang Industrial. Uh, show of hands, anybody heard of Chang Industrial here in town? A couple? Okay. Um, so I guess I'll thank Jeremy for introducing me to Ashley, who invited me to come speak today. Um, my understanding is this is a leadership series, and so as president of a local company, I was honored for the opportunity. Uh, so my goal today is just to introduce Chang Industrial to everybody here, uh, and then I'm, I have a deck, but I'm not really invested in sticking to it. So if you guys have questions along the way, we do not need to uh, stick to waiting to the end. So feel free. Um, so before we get started, does anybody know what this is? Right. Boston Dynamics, robot dog, spot. That one? You know the answers, so you have to go last. We did. I did this once already for Jeremy. Delivers your food at Blue Bamboo. Is that what it is? Similar, similar. It is an autonomous robot. This is a Moxie, which is uh, one of the robots that was unveiled by Baptist Health probably about a year ago now that they're running a pilot on. I think it's at the Wolfson's, the Children's Hospital. So it's... Um, Autonomous, which means it drives by itself, and it's mostly serving to meet and greet with different uh, patients and staff, and it can, it does have a little drawer where it can carry supplies and deliver. It's not a very big drawer, but it, it can do some, you know, small, small payload. That one? Uh, is that Amazon? It is the Amazon. It's, so Kiva is the robotics company that Amazon purchased a number of years ago, and that's what that one is. Everybody knows that one. I have one of these, I hate it, but we still all have one. And then that one's just in there for a joke. Uh, yeah, that's the future, right? Hopefully they don't kill us. Um, so Chang Industrial, we are uh, first and foremost an engineering company that's focused on data-driven solutions to drive innovation and technology for all of our clients. Um, we have a slew of team members from engineers to project managers to data analysts, and we, uh, we serve as an arm of our client's engineering team. So basically what we do is we engage with the client, we meet their engineering team, we walk the site, we understand what uh, the challenges are, whether it's production, um, manufacturing, uh, healthcare, e-commerce, uh, we've done a number of projects in any one of those industries. Uh, so we're not selective in, in who we work with. It's just basically you come to us if you've got challenges around uh, staffing or efficiency or just how your operations are running. And we are thrilled to get involved and figure out what the best use case is. Um, and we do that by starting with a feasibility study. And we are more than happy to come to you and say, this does not have a payback. This is probably not the right fit for you. Or we can say, here's what we would recommend. You might receive a ROI within three years, five years. It kind of depends on the solution. And we'll work with the client to step through that before we engage in a long-term engineering process. So a little bit about our history. We were created in 2017. Um, anybody in the room know Matt Chang? Met him? He's our founder, hence the, the name of the company. So he started in 2017. I joined in 2018 along with our other business partner, Ross. And from there, we've grown the company to about 40 individuals. Uh, we have about 20 of them that are full-time, and then we have another 20 that are flex in and out of part-time, full-time, just depending on what their capacity is and what, what the work is that they're interested in doing. Uh, in 2019, we won an award for the largest autonomous fleet. This should actually say mixed autonomous fleet. That's the first project we completed as the Chang Industrial Entity. And by mixed fleet, I mean we had different types of technologies, self-driving, um, automated guided vehicles, and autonomous mobile robots. We'll talk a little bit more about what those are in a little bit. Um, but we have basically implemented a solution within a facility where you had different technologies working together to solve some of the challenges the facility was facing. Um, in 2021, we celebrated the completion of the second project for that same client. Um, that was Keurig Dr. Pepper. We stood up a second mixed fleet autonomous system and went through acceptance. And uh, then we're proud to see that the client took the system and started immediately making alterations to actually improve some of the efficiencies within it. So that's a success story in our opinion is when we can 
develop and hand over a technology system to a client, and then they can embrace it, learn how to run it on their own, and start developing new ways to do it and make it more efficient. Uh, and then uh, for everybody that's local here knows we celebrate the Fast 50 every year. Uh, we've been uh, blessed to have been awarded that a couple years in a row. Our first one was in 2021, and we celebrated again last year also. And then uh, another milestone, just so you understand a little bit about what we do, Dr. Tim Way and Dr. Don Kapner both joined our team in 2021. And that is important because we have, with the help of these two individuals, been able to establish an R&D sector of our business. Uh, and you'll learn a little bit about that too. But Dr. Tim Way was the Dean of Engineering at the University of Nebraska before joining us. Uh, Don Kapner, some of you in the room might know him. He was the Dean of Business um, at Jacksonville University at the Davis College. Uh, he's now the Dean at Marshall University. So he serves, well, Dr. Tim Way works with us on some of the engineering. Um, he's got a lot of knowledge around patents and developing new technologies and new use cases. Uh, Dr. Kapner is very helpful when it comes to business planning and strategy and how we then take those technologies and implement them. Uh, so those two individuals have been huge assets for us and it's allowed us to really grow what we call our IP studio, which is uh, the R&D branch of our company. This is, I won't, I'm not gonna dive deep into this. Um, you can pull this on our website. This is just who our company is, our purpose, our niche, um, our statement of faith. We are a, a Christian-driven company, so we do believe in giving back to our communities and really diving into how we can help build our community around us. Uh, we believe in first fruits, so we do uh, tithe on some of our profits, and then we do also tithe through our time. Um, and to prove that to you, we do have uh, a history of tithing. These are some of the different entities that we like to give to. Some of them are here local, others are overseas, um, orphanages, uh, missionary um, and so this is just kind of a history over the last few years as our success has grown our ability and our blessings have grown to give back to the other to others and then this is a little uh, snippet of some of our volunteer hours and what our group has done over the past few years um, it's just kind of for fun Malbec's in there he's kind of the team favorite he uh, he serves at Wolfson's Children's Hospital every week he goes and cheers up the sick kids so uh, that's a little bit about who we are, what we do, um, and how we operate. Uh, another piece of how we give back to our community. Uh, I don't know, did anybody attend the JVC this past year? It was in March. You were there. Um, did you like it? Yeah. Did you go back this year? Um, for, the, for the next one out, out of the club. We're doing it again in March 2024. Yeah, yeah. Good. All right. Um, so we, we established a uh, venture competition here in Jacksonville, and uh, there are some other venture entities here in town, but we felt we really needed to bring something that was um, collaborative and would allow for entrepreneurial uh, development and focus within the city of Jacksonville. So this was hosted at the um, JIT, I'm going to get it wrong, the Transportation Center, JTA's new Transportation Center down in La Villa. Um, they allowed us to use the space. We filled the room. We featured four or five different companies and uh, a local healthcare company actually won uh, the venture competition and got a grant and they're moving forward. So we'll be doing it again next year if you're interested. Um, you know, we have partnerships with the JAGS, um, First Citizens Bank, and a lot of others here in town that are gonna be helping us put that on. All right, so that's, that's just who we are. Now, what we do and who we work with, this is a snippet of some of the different projects. You heard me talk about Keurig Dr. Pepper. Um, we're also very involved in uh, government entities, P3 uh, projects, and city planning. So you can see both the middle top is Lordstown Smart Hub. That's Lordstown, Ohio. Um, that's been in the news a lot because of the GM plant that was up there that got shut down. Um, just wasn't making it work. So um, they have now decided to innovate and turn that city into a technology hub for smart transportation. I don't exactly remember the stat, but I think like 24% of all uh, truck logistics runs through Lordstown or that corridor right there. And so what, they're, what we have just started developing in a feasibility phase is how to use uh, smart yard logistics, um, autonomous trailer movements to 
help with moving uh, trucking entities in and out of a facility a lot faster um, and partnering with uh, a lot of the different retail outlets that are there. You have Macy's, um, Home Depot, uh, a few others there, and how we start developing a smarter logistics system so that you can connect the different trucking entities with what's happening there in Lordstown as all of that traffic's coming in and out. Uh, we also partner with some startups. So Pure Harvest and SRM stands for Snake River Manufacturing. Those are two companies that are in their infancy, uh, less than five years. Pure Harvest is a vertical farming technology. Um, does anybody know, everybody knows what a food desert is? Does anybody know how many there are here in Jacksonville? The last I was told um, was there's 22 communities within the greater Jacksonville area that are considered food deserts. And so something we are trying to partner with, and we've been talking with both JTA and JEA on this, is how to develop some organic vertical farming areas within those specific food deserts. Uh, Edward Waters, there's one of those communities is right past the Edward Waters College. So it's how do we develop an area where you can start developing organic food that's fresh, available to the community immediately, and then also start providing jobs in that area to learn how to do the farming, how to harvest the crops, how to plant new ones. And these, uh, this technology turns over every 14 or 17 days. So the idea is you get a fresh supply of food almost immediately within a, an area when you plant them. Um, so that's something we've got going. The reason we're partnering with JTA is because we want to focus on being on corridors where there's transportation available for people to get to and from them. Um, so that's a little bit of our R&D and also just our community outreach. And then Swire Coca-Cola, uh, that's another big box manufacturing facility where we put some autonomous and just some standard automation in. Um, and that was international, which is why that's one we're proud of too. We worked on that with, a, with the Coke company in Taiwan. Oh, I'm not supposed to do that yet. Okay. Who knows what automation is? Like everybody says it, but what is it? Oh, you're going to answer. Yeah, well, yeah. Sorry, everybody's eating. This is terrible for you, but. <laughs> oh, automation is uh, any, uh, no user interaction. Is that a good summary? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. 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 No, I like it. Anybody else? So then what's autonomy? It's like the next level. Yeah. So yeah. Dynamic or static, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So what we like to say is automation is something you can do like without user interaction, right? But there's a lot of guide rails around it. I've got guarding as the first one, right? It's it's usually a fixed element. It can be run without a lot of um, operator intervention or very minimal. But you usually will see a lot of you know either safety fencing or barricades or uh, something of that nature to make sure people don't go where they're not supposed to go. Autonomy is the exact opposite. Well, not the exact opposite. It's, it's the next level, as Jeremy said. It's taking automation and making it people safe so that you can coexist uh, within a space. So some of the robots you'll see us showing, they're autonomous mobile robots because they are designed to be where humans are. If you think of your Roomba in your home, I know mine anyway, it just goes in like a five- Radio, five foot radius and that's about it. So that area is clean. But like if you walk by it, it generally stops and waits either till the obstacle has passed or it find, it will no notice the obstacle and then it'll work around it. That's what autonomy is. So next level of automation where there's not a lot of operator interface, but they're also safe to be around in a human popular place. Um, so to give you an idea of, of what we do, this is a short video. I will try and talk through it, but it's only about 30 seconds. What you're going to see just in the opening clip here, there's an autonomous mobile robot on the bottom. And you can see the, and it's got the lights, and then there's a little conveyor top on it. And what this is doing is it's uh, interfacing with what you would think of as an existing piece of conveyor. It's picking up a payload, and it's taking it somewhere else. This is a screenshot of a, a lights out operation. Yeah, this is going to go fast. Um, another clip of an autonomous robot interfacing with a stand. This is the Keurig facility. This is where we put uh, 80 autonomous mobile robots in. This is the other Keurig facility. You can see this is dropping off a payload of uh, finished K-cups 
on a pallet, I'm gonna drop it on a stand, decompress the lift, and then it will drive away and that, those, uh, that pallet will stay there for a fork truck driver to come pick up and move to a staging lane. Yeah. <laughs> How many employees would it have in it? Um, this facility is their facility in Tennessee. It's actually their flagship right now. And so they're running around 700 people across three shifts. Even though there's so much happening without the facility. That's, so I'm sorry, that was prior to us implementing some of the automation systems and the robots. Okay. So we would say that an AMR, an autonomous mobile robot, is equivalent to 0.6 people. So you're going to say, well, Kate, that doesn't make sense. That means I have to put more robots in than I do people, but that's across three shifts. So 0 0.6 people, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, depending on exactly what it's doing. So across sh three shifts, it's now equivalent to almost two persons, mm -hmm. right? And you're not, um, you don't have to pay them benefits, right? The robots more or less just want to get charged when they're hungry. Um, you know, and then they need maintenance and what have you. So when we design a system, we design a system for roughly 60 to 70% capacity of what is needed. We challenge the customer, show us that you're gonna max out this system. And then the nice part about it is once you implement this robotic system, you need one network, right? You, you need to, the mapping and setting up the system and in, implementing the vehicles is the hardest part. Once they're running, if you need to start scaling because production's going up, staffing shortages are becoming more of a problem than they already are you can say call up the call us up we'll work with the the robotics vendor say they need four more robots they're you know they're running at capacity and they're they, they're, they don't have enough turnover right so if and i'm asking that stage uh anywhere from a third to 50 percent is what you can run on if the robots are there generally now that that would be by when i say 700 you're including all of like your overhead staff, right? Accounting, HR, gotcha. within the, the front office, probably within the production facility, you're in the four to 500 range of people. And then that's, you know, by different areas, but by a department that's implementing these, you can probably save about, yeah, I would say one third to one half of the staff. Okay. And the, the switch to that, right, is a lot of people are saying, well, Kate, how do you feel about taking people's jobs? You're putting in robots, you're taking people's jobs. Um, we have a healthcare project going on right now in which within the limits of Jacksonville alone, there are 1,200 open nursing positions that cannot be filled. They cannot find the staff to do it. And so we're implementing a robotic system on a couple of patient floors. We're running a pilot program first. But the idea is we don't wanna take any nursing jobs. I do not wanna show up at a hospital and have someone tell me a robot's gonna give me an IV. I would say thank you, pass, and go to the next hospital. But if I can be in a patient room with a nurse that is focused on giving me the right medical care and the health care that I need and not saying I've got to go get whatever supplies or I've got to go call someone to do whatever, great. If she can stay in the room and provide the care that I need and not run herself ragged, I should, I'm sorry, herself or himself ragged with whatever menial tasks also need to be performed, that's a success story for us and for automation and autonomy. Um, and the same thing, when we were standing up this system at the Keurig facility, I will tell you that uh, we were doing our startup and commissioning of the vehicles and the clients were on site with us, right? As we'd stand these up, we always go through operator training. And so for the two or three month period that we're commissioning and testing these, we tell the client, you need to have the people that are gonna run this system ready and available because they're going to test and commission with us because once the system's accepted they are now the stakeholders in the system um and within the first month of testing they said can we go faster you know we had just come out of covid they didn't have the staff showing up that they needed they were constantly short on staff and they said we need to go faster how quick can we get them running and that was two years ago and they're still running today Yeah. Or, okay, so you work we with do. A client first and then source the best 
best hardware and then work to facilitate. We do. Stuff. So, uh, for example, a healthcare facility, you're not going to use right, right. these robots that we were just showing in a manufacturing site. It just, it would not work. They're a little too, I, won't, I don't want to say clunky, but they're not made for, right. And then um, there are so many different OEMs out there now for robotics that all have different form factors, different payloads. Some of them carry on their back, like what, what I showed. Some of them are a tugger system. Like they have the robot and then they have kind of a hook and they, they drag payload behind them. Um, but the majority of the robotic OEMs do not want to sell to the end client. They don't want to have to sign up for performance guarantees. They don't want to have to sign up for um, lifetime services or continuing services after commissioning. They don't want any of that. They want to make and sell robots and be done. And so we, as systems designers, will meet with the client, understand the complications, what they're trying to solve. We'll develop a system, usually through like a concept engineering stage. And then we'll start, depending on what the final concept is, we'll develop RFPs and we'll go out to the OEMs that we think have the right form factor and the right fit for the project. And then once we get those bids back, we'll, we'll qualify who the right fits are. I mean, there's, there's pricing and whatnot too, but you have to make sure they can do the job that you've designed for. And so then we'll develop basically some kind of a matrix or a scoring system, present that to the client, and then the client will agree. And then we do the contracting with the OEM, and we are the ones that provide the performance guarantees or the warranties or whatever continuing services. That all comes from the client directly to us, and the OEM does not have to sign up for any of those. Yeah, so any, uh, any of these OEMs to sign up as a uh, certified systems integrator, you have to send a certain number of your staff to their training. It's usually like a week-long boot camp. And then they have refreshers annually. And then there's hotlines that they are tied into with our... So we, we have trained robotic te technicians on our team who have now gone through training of four or five different OEMs, different trainings. And every single system is different, right? And even... If you can see on the screen, there's a dual screen right now. You have the pallet on one side, and on the other side, there's a map. That's the fleet manager map. You have to map the facility, and you need someone who's able to manage that and change it. So you might have, there might be a, a week where the client is pulling out one of their production lines and it replacing it, or doing major maintenance, and they're like, this aisleway is not available. We are not traveling. No forklifts are going through here. No robots are going through here, nothing. Okay, so we go in and we will take the map and we will change it and show, basically put a closed area in the map so that the AMRs now know, like, I can't go that way. And they operate using the map, which is in their brain. But then they also operate as a fleet. They know where one another are from the map. And then they also use LiDAR and 3D camera to scan, constantly scan the areas around them as they're traveling. So if there's an obstacle shows up in their path that they're not a, that they weren't prepared for, say a I don't know safety cone, they're gonna come up to it. They're gonna stop, scan it, figure out shape, size, what have you, and then they're gonna slowly. We call it turtle mode because it's at their slow speed. They'll slowly inch around it, and then they'll get back on the path that was designed in the map, and then they'll go. Anything else? So I think there's, there's different types, right? So we're, what I'm talking about here is autonomous mobile robots. There are an awful lot of different types of automation and technologies within the healthcare field from predictive analytics. You know, people are talking about AI, there's wearables, there's just an upgrade in data sensing within the room and understanding what's going on. We don't get into that stuff. Um, we do not want to deal with HIPAA. We're not interested in that. We don't want patient information. We don't want any of that. So we are very focused on looking at a hospital or a healthcare facility as a, basically an enclosed supply chain, right? You have laundry facilities, meal facilities, what have you. You have the patient rooms, which is in an e-commerce setting would be the end user. Um, but there are a lot of different things. There are like robotic lifting mechanisms that some different facilities are testing to help with getting patients up into the bathroom without needing an aid in the room. Um, 
there's an awful lot of liability with those two. So to my knowledge, there's not anything like that out in the field right now. There are some different companies trying to pilot it and test it, but especially in senior facilities, you have, you know, you have the mental aspect, you have the physical aspect. I think it's just, my, my guess is that's in our future to have a lot of that kind of robotic and automation aiding, but I think it's an awful lot of red tape and an awful lot of testing before yeah. it's something that's Mm-hmm. And you know that that type of relevance, you know, and maybe it'll come eventually. But... So there's a Jacksonville's tough because it's not an urban setting with sidewalks and things like that. There are a lot of different types of robotic deliveries. Neuro is one that some people recognize. It's kind of it's almost looks like a smart car, but a little bit smaller. There was a video that went around a week or so ago. It was in. Uh, Tennessee, the uh, University of Tennessee was having their marching parade or something like that. And there was a neuro that was trying to deliver a meal and it, it, it just faulted out because the band came by and he was like, I'm just trying to go to drop my food off. And the band came by unplanned and you could see it. It was just in the middle and it kept just like turning and was trying to figure it. And it just finally stopped. It was like, I, it's like putting a cone on a cruise in San Francisco. It was like, I just, I give up. I can't. Um, so there are things like that. The trick is with those is usually you need some kind of a, a stable surface, right? So places in Jacksonville where there's food deserts, a lot of times maybe the roadways and the transportation network isn't as strong either. So it's hard for uh, an autonomous robot to navigate those kind of um, planes. Or just to fetch inside the home, kind of like the, you mentioned the nurses use them as a go fetch. And yeah. I was thinking in the, the home health care where someone's a, sort of a, almost a semi-invalid yeah, that you could. That would be the same kind of idea in in a home. Um, I actually, when I was in Barcelona earlier this year, and their healthcare hub was piloting. It was similar looking to the Moxie I showed, kind of a like a mini little human. So people that are shut ins or older people might feel like they have a companion of sorts. But it can also be programmed. You'd have to have certain you know pick up or drop off locations for it to be kind of programmed. Um, but yeah, you definitely could have. And then otherwise it it was programmed to just follow someone around. It's like I walked in front of it, it lasered on my being, and then it just started following me around. Um, so yeah, there's, there's things out there, and I think there's gonna be a lot more to come in that field. Okay, so we've already kind of talked about this, but we'll get into it. So technology and industries, these are the different uh, industries and verticals that we work in. Uh, manufacturing, e-commerce, healthcare, Agriculture, uh, agriculture has to do with the vertical farming, but also uh, farming itself. So we talked about Snake River Manufacturing a little bit ago. Those are, they are focused on developing uh, electric and then also autonomous tractors for harvesting of beans, potatoes. Um, we worked with a company that has a autonomous strawberry harvester over in Great Britain. Um, and not only does it harvest, but it also uses some AI sensing to uh, detect when the plants need to be watered, and then it has spray adapters on it and just kind of drops and says, all right, they need to be watered, water them, take off, the next day comes, checks them, turns them. Um, so there's a lot going on in the agriculture field as um, more and more folks are not coming out of high school and saying, I want to go be a farmer, or I want to go grow whatever, you know, that's one of the things I think we're facing as a population is the food sources and then who's going to be providing them. And then transportation, um, the tractor trailer you see there is uh, an autonomous tractor trailer. Uh, the, they recently did a test in Tennessee and it drove from Knoxville to Nashville. I can't remember, it was about 200 miles. And it was a truck that drove autonomously. There were no um, there's no driver in the truck. It went, it delivered its payload. Now I say that it was a test. The highway patrol, everything they do was involved in making sure there was no traffic on the road. It went from point A to point B. They had, um, Ericsson was involved in providing a continuous 5G network all the way from point A to point B to make sure that it didn't lose signal. Um, that's another thing. Anybody that's following the cruise saga and 
San Francisco when all those cruises lost their signal and at the music festival. And then everyone got mad because there were just cars parked in the road with no drivers that you could knock on and be like, move. Um, that was what happened. The, you know, the cell service got jammed up because everyone left and wanted an Uber or a ride home and the cars couldn't get their signal. So, um, you know, there's a lot of testing going on. Certain states are a lot more amenable to autonomous truck testing, Texas, Tennessee. Um, and then there's others that are kind of like, no, we don't want anything to do with that yet. So that's continues to be a legislative battle, I would say. Did you have a question? I did. Um, is, I, I read somewhere that, that was, uh, it was done in Tennessee for uh, an altitude reason. They need somewhere flat. Is that? Yeah, flatness definitely helps. I think, um, so you, if you have to go up a hill, right, you're using a lot more horsepower. And when it comes to charging and conserving energy to make sure you get from point A to point B, especially in a test, they want to make sure it was successful, right? So it's not a, a technology limitation on the what, LIDAR, uh, computer vision, anything like that? I don't believe so. Somebody might tell me I'm wrong. Um, we do have within any type of uh, facility that we implement the, the robots, there is a, there's a floor flatness requirement, but like, you're not buying K-cups in a facility that's built like this either, right? Like everything needs to be flat. But it's, for that, it was more the wear and tear on the vehicles of needing to go up and down bumpy and that there's a lot of sensors and things like that. So could be the same that now on a road, if you're just going up kind of a, a hill, my guess is you're not really feeling that impact versus like bumpiness, but you are putting a drag on the battery power itself. Um, and there could be some, some, I guess it would depend, LiDAR is going to go straight out, right? So if you're coming in, you're not necessarily going to see the angle. So I think there'd be some rotating concepts to look at there. It's a, it's a big IoT problem in manufacturing, like the, the, the strawberry things. You have to make a geofence. So are you, do you guys own the network? Uh, and no. So in, in Keurig, you're, they, you leverage their, we well what we do is we ask we don't do it there be, with any of these implementations there is an all new IT project that gets built along with it and so usually we'll say you need an its own protected Wi-Fi network most of the manufacturing robots just work on Wi-Fi um, but what we'll say is you need to develop a new Wi-Fi network specifically for the robots to run on with they, some kind of pass. Yeah, they'll own it, they'll operate it. So from the, and usually the long pull in the tent for these schedules, as, as well as how long the lead time is on getting the equipment, right? Cause it's got to place an order and then they start manufacturing and then ship and everything else. Lead times can be long, but the, the lead time for an IT development is just as long. You're kicking the IT development team off and that's usually the, the client's IT team with a subject matter expert or two on our side but they're the ones that have to implement it. They're the ones that have to build the network. They don't want us in there. But we don't really want to be in their, in their stuff because there's so much other stuff besides just putting a new network in that then they are going to end up owning anyway once we finish acceptance and hand over the system. So yeah, there's definitely an IT. So in any uh, budget CapEx that we develop, there's always a, um, an owner's responsibility bucket and we'll, flat, we'll call out things like that. Like we, here's our portion of the budget, but here's other stuff. For an entire CapEx project, here's the stuff you need to consider. Licensing. Sorry? Another million bucks from a Rocky licensing. Yeah. There's, there's licensing. There's all kinds of stuff that usually with these systems, the first year is included in the install and the commissioning. So that would be part of us. But then it's like, hey, reminder, you have these additional OPEXs to consider for however many years. And those are usually factored into the business case when we're figuring out what the payback is. And, you know, you have your savings on FTEs, but you also have additional costs. Um, I don't know what my requirements are on time. So I'll just go quick. These are just quick snippets. We're talking about technology in um, agriculture. So this is a, an autonomous tractor. There, there's usually a driver on it when they're testing, but in this case, there's nobody. Um, they've also got, this is called Moose, and it's, a, it's just a rugged utility vehicle. And they've been using this a lot for an environmental engineering to go out and collect data and do sensing 
um, because it's driverless and it can go out into areas that maybe haven't been cleared or what have you. And then we already know spot. We, we looked at spot already. So it's going to go up the stairs. Uh, so I'll give you a few case studies. We talked about Keurig um, and the K-Cups. So we did two sites for them. I won't spend tons of time on this because we already talked about it, but I will give you a quick view of what this looked like and the noises it makes while it operates. It's in a slow mode now because it's navigating through a door and then you can see it speeds up once it gets clear of the doorway. Um, we're in commissioning, so there's four truck drivers waiting. And then you have another one coming in behind to uh, do the same thing. So they're leaving the production facility and heading into the warehouse to drop off for um, to those stands we saw in the other video for then staging and warehousing. Are they able to pick up essentially right from the end of the production line and packaging? We designed it that way. Okay. Yeah, so um, pallets are built on a stand right. in this scenario. They used to be built at the end of line. Each end of line had a robotic arm that just built a pallet um, on, the on, on the floor and then the forklift came. So we built those, the stand you saw it drop off at, it was kind of a U-shaped. Yeah. Uh, the pallets, empty pallets now get set on that stand. End of line had to be reprogrammed so it didn't smash through the pallet because it was now two feet higher. But it, yeah. yeah, so it, it now built on the stand to the pallet and then once it's built, the AMR gets the signal, hey, you've got a payload you need to come pick up, and then it'll show up and do the same thing. It'll engage its lift, pull out, drop it, and then drive off. Um, so something else we focus on, food safety. Anybody have kids in the room? I do. No, I mean, well, you tell me. Like, who likes these? Do we still like them? Do we know what happened, like, two days ago? They recalled 30,000 pounds of dino-shaped nuggets because of metal shavings. Um, so we were talking earlier about uh, our IP studio and our R&D branch of our group. So we were partnered with a, a company that's developed a handheld x-ray machine. Um, it's currently FDA cleared and is used in hospitals. Uh, I know Mayo Clinic has a couple on hand. Um, they do not require all the, anybody that's gone and gotten x-rays, you have to wear the lead vests or whatever. Uh, the exposure is like 0.1% of what it is in the large hospital grade x-ray room, so you can basically just use it. Um, pretty, It's the size of an iron, really. And uh, a lot of the use cases for it are at, you know, schools, right? You get a football player that's injured on the field. You don't know if you should move them or not or what's happening. Bring out the x-ray machine, take a look. You can kind of diagnose how critical is it. Kid probably needs help either way, but, you know. Then it's powered with um, AI graphics that you can pull up right on your phone. There's an app, and you can image, and within 5 to 10 seconds, it's showing you what it saw. So this is a medical-grade device. We have a partnership with this company. And we said, what about food manufacturing? What could we do with it? Um, and the thought process is you could use an x-ray device on your quality lines and start checking for foreign objects, right? Foreign object detection within the line. So um, we did some tests on this at, uh, at Georgia Tech Research Institute. We have a partnership with them too. And uh, we started doing beef and chicken um, and some ground meat. And we ran conveyor slugs through and did, and it's continuous, right? You can set it to just be continuous and just, I think it's like a thousand images a, a minute or something like that. Um, and then the next phase that we're working on now is developing the predictive AI to program into the imaging so it can start reading those images and flagging like, hey, section 39 of the conveyor has an, you know, check it. You don't necessarily have to scrap the meat, but go check and see what it was. Um, so that's what we're working on now as one of our uh, our R&D projects. Um, 
and that's what Dr. Tim Way has been uh, and been leading for us. So that one's pretty cool. I like that one a lot, especially the chicken nugget thing. Just was perfect with me coming to speak. <laughs> have they called you? We actually we uh, you can't say. we yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Someone said someone this. Yeah. I can give you an NDA and then we can talk about it if you want. Um, technology and e-commerce. So everybody knows, you know, Amazon um, and, you know, the likes. And then a lot of the uh, micro fulfillment centers that are starting to pop up um, to support Amazon. But for them, their business case is how full can we make the building? You know, we go to stack it as high as the ceiling minus sprinklers right like that's really what you want is how full can you make the building because you're either moving product or you're charging somebody rent for storing their product in your racking so how dense can we make it and then if you're going to make it dense how are you getting in and out of there right in a normal conventional racking system you have to be able to get fork trucks in and out with a lift so people can pull things off of a shelf um, you can see this is a quadrant which is uh, adverb is the name of this company um, and you can see it's running up and down aisles of shelving and it's pulling, picking bins or totes or whatever you want. Um, and then it will bring it to whoever's doing the packaging. So instead of people going to the goods and having to fetch them, get them, package them, you're now developing a paradigm shift and it's becoming goods to person. So you don't have people having to go fetch stuff. You just have folks focused on doing the packaging and shipping out the door and the goods are going to come to you pull out what you need from whatever bin. I need a pair of Nike women's size 10, pull them out, scan them, send the, the tote back to get stored until the next order. And then technology in the healthcare facility. So we talked about this a little bit already. Um, you know, I think everybody has heard it multiple times from different areas, but we have an aging population um, here in the US for sure. Um, over in Asia, I've heard stats that like China's going to have half of its population by like 2080. So there's a lot of people aging out of our system as far as providing services, right? So when we talk again, Kate, why are you taking jobs with robots? I don't feel like I am. I feel like I'm building some resiliency into our system. But also you have a lot of people who are going to need more care and you don't have the youth to provide that care. You don't have the up and coming generation. So again, robotics, we're piloting in the healthcare facility now. We think there's a lot of use cases. Um, what we're focusing on right now is movement of materials and supplies to and from patient rooms. So linens, um, IV bags. We are not doing anything with medical um, prescriptions because that has a whole new you know, badge, security, what have you. And we're not doing anything with meals yet because that, uh, there's a lot of timing requirements on that and control around when it leaves the facility, the food facility till when it has to get to the patient. And so we're starting small with the, um, we polled a group of nurses and found out what their biggest pain points are and what are the things that they have to constantly go and get or go find or need and an instant. And, um, you know, linens is one of the biggest things you're constantly having to change linens for patients or whomever. It'd be great if they just showed up at the room so you're not leaving and going to get those and coming back. Um, there's some other options within the healthcare facility. There's um, floor scrubbers. The one with the blue tower, that's a blue light. That's for cleaning. So after a patient has left to turn the room over faster, you could bring in an um, autonomous robot with a blue light stack that would basically spray the whole room with this ultraviolet light for cleaning purposes. Um, and then the yellow are these little, they're tabletop AMRs, basically. They're little ones. And it's similar to the e-commerce concept of bringing goods to a person where they start picking the supplies or could be prescriptions or whatever and running them to and from the bins that need to be sent out to different patient rooms versus somebody having to go into a supply room and find what they need. And then agriculture. So we talked about the autonomous and the full electric uh, tractors that we're working with Snake River on. Um, to do that, we're building an awful lot of sensing. And uh, we actually had our first patent granted for a uh, snowblower sensor. We're developing an autonomous snowblower attachment to... I'm not mechanical. I'm going to get all the words wrong. So I'm just going to say there's a, a sensor within the chute that can measure the density 
and how fast you're blowing snow. So you can start driving the vehicle towards, you know, you start, the flow starts either reducing or your density is not as good. You're gonna start sending the vehicle to another area. Like you, you've got this area, it's time to go clear something else. Um, so that's something we've done. And then the same company that Snake River that does snow removal vehicles, they also do potato, bean and corn harvesting. So they're working on uh, driverless adoptions for those. And this is the platform around, you know, we take the sensors, mount them. You're going to have a control system that's going to bring you all your data. And then that's got to get uh, communicated up to an overall layer of uh, software that's going to give you all of the data and the analytics you need on how to run the system more efficiently. Um, you get a lot of engine data on this and, you know, what do you, what's your drag? Um, and so that's, that's the concept around this one. And then technology and transportation, uh, autonomous shuttles. So we've heard about JTA and what they're trying to do with Bay Street. Um, there's a lot of other cities in the US that are trying to implement shuttles uh, of some kind, usually in dense urban areas and in you know one to two mile segments as pilots, because everybody's concerned about pedestrian safety. We are too. So that's why you start small. Um, robo taxis, everybody knows about crews and what's going on in San Francisco or like cone gate with the safety cones that they're putting on cars. Um, so they, I, I'd like to think that Cruz, cause Waymo is still operating, right? They just took Cruz's license away. I'd like to think Cruz has a good working model, but they probably bit off more they can chew a little too fast. So they'll be back is my prediction. And then trucking, we talked a little bit about trucking and the autonomous uh, pilot that that's been done already. I think that's about it. Uh, technology in a stack. Again, I'm not the um, network expert here, but this is around how you develop some uh, 5G networks dedicated. So we talk about Bay Street or somewhere else. That's one of the considerations, right? You're not borrowing like the public Wi-Fi to run these shuttles, right? So what kind of infrastructure from a network perspective are you going to build or supply to make sure that these vehicles can run continuously um, and without interruption? And so that's kind of what this is about is developing a 5G network, creating a good uh, fleet manager that can keep track of um, one, where the vehicles are, two, um, how well are they charged, um, and then also can start tracking uh, ridership. This is a, it's a, a pretty much a useless screenshot for you because you can't read any of it, but this is some of the research we've continued to refresh every couple months around different states in the legislation they're passing on uh, autonomous vehicles and testing. So Florida and Georgia, you can see they're allowing um, manned operations on testing. Uh, and then most of these other states, this is probably alphabetical. So you've got Hawaii, Idaho, Illinois, Indiana. They're not really allowing anything. They're not on board yet. Um, so that's pretty much what I had to share about what we are and who we work with. Um, transformational technology and autonomous systems prevalent everywhere. It will continue to be. And I will adamantly tell you that I don't think robots are stealing jobs. I think they're building resiliency for us. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, taking over over what has uh, how does that happen or not happen? Because um, you, you can hear all the conspiracy theory people. Sure. Um, and then, uh, is there any issue with the AI on the phones and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, personally, I don't think it comes to the point of like the Will Smith I Robot movie, but I do think there is a lot of caution that needs to be taken as we develop it. Um, you know, everybody's looking at chat GPT or whatever chat bot you're using now. And one of the things you've got to be careful about is how you prompt it, right? You can't give it too much information. The idea is to give it just enough for it to spit out whatever you're looking for. Um, but I do think there's a lot of, I would say, not legislation per se, but there's got to be a lot of caution around how we're developing it. And I, there are some 
folks that think we should just go full speed ahead. So when you say give it too much information, mm -hmm. are you saying uh, if we give it too much information, it'll, it can get to a place where it can really think on its own? Well, I think of it more from a privacy and protection perspective. Like, I don't want to say, you know, hey, I need Kerrigan to help me draft this paper. So chat GPT, what should I tell Kerrigan to do? on this task. Like, I don't need to be giving it names. I don't need to be giving it um, any kind of identifiable, identifiable information, in my opinion. I think it should be very generic. Um, give me two paragraphs on mobility as a service and just let it spit it out. And then no reason why I need it. And if it doesn't give you what you want, then say, well, frame it from the context of a city representative or something to that effect. But I think giving it access to too much is then becomes when it's our problem right because now it has that once it once it's in there it's stored and it's not going anywhere it's not coming back out um so i think it's on all of the users to be more cautious with what you feed into it and it's going to grow regardless but um i don't i don't foresee a future where it's taking over and trying to ruin our lives or whatever but i do see a future where you're going to automate a lot of processes and things within back office or, you know, even within, you know, I look at bookkeeping and that's no offense to any bookkeepers, but it's, there's a lot of um, data entry and just repetitive tasks that I don't think there's a problem with giving it that. Now then again, you can go back to, well, what about privacy, right? Cause you could have client names and things like that running through it. I don't know the answer to how you solve that yet, but I do think there's, incremental steps to getting to a successful future with it.